What's happening, everybody? Boy Big Brando, and welcome to another episode of BS with Brando. Uh, this one right here, we're just going to be talking about marketing. And when I'm saying marketing, I'm going to talk about a lot of my failures when it came to marketing and some of my wins. But what I do understand is there's a lot of people that watch my channel that really don't understand um, how to promote their stuff. They don't know anything about advertising or marketing or sales in general. A lot of the people that watch my channel might have like really dope ideas on t-shirt designs that they want to sell and put out into the market. They just don't know how to get those designs into the faces of the people that should be buying their stuff. So I want to kind of touch on this. I wanted to make this uh, the second episode to BSing with Brando, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be talking a lot more about this on the channel and also on this podcast. Um, but I did want to touch on it because this is one of those subjects that kind of gets overlooked, but I think is very crucial to anybody that owns a business in general, not just in the t-shirt space, but just business in general. Marketing is a big tool and it's something that's really needed um, for your business to thrive on. Um, now, there's a lot of people that kind of get into this and they're just like, well, I'm just going to use social media for my marketing. And that's cool. Um for myself, I'm not from the era of just knowing social media. I come from the era before cell phones were invented or social media was even a thing. This is, you know, I'm talking about long ago when I would get my information from like mag magazine advertisements was a big thing. Um, I would watch commercials, even like radio ads. They would read stuff on the radio and that's how you would find out about stuff or even bus benches. Bus benches used to be a big advertising space where that's how I would find out if a new album was coming out was I seen the bus bench ad. And I'm from Los Angeles. And a big thing for us was stealing the bus bench backings just to have in our garage. Like these things were huge. And it was a cool thing just to take them and just have them, I guess, collect them. I, I don't know. But I remember that was a big thing in, in the 90s was stealing the bus bench backings just to have them if somebody was dropping a new album. Nowadays, I'll just drive right past the bus bench. I don't even read the advertisements. Um, but that's kind of where I come from is that's the advertising and the marketing that used to speak to me because that's what was in my face or that's how I gathered my information, especially like when new shoes would come out. If people remember the East Bay magazine, that's how we would find out that, you know, Certain Jordans are coming out because somebody would have the East Bay magazine. If they didn't get it mailed to them, they would see it in school and somebody was looking at it. And if you remember the East Bay, you would get in there and you'd circle the shoes that you wanted and be like, man, I can't wait for these to come out because the launch date is on there. Or you would see Jordan wearing something and you're like, man, when do these come out? Then you would see it in the East Bay. Um, so I, I kind of take my marketing strategy from that and apply it to today's times or to the social media era and stuff like that. But when I was starting these businesses early on or starting these clothing brands, my marketing was all over the place because we were at a weird time in the industry of social media starting to be used, um, especially like when like MySpace was kind of a big deal. MySpace, people were just on there for as a social aspect, but we weren't looking at it as a business when it first came out. A lot of what we're doing was just socially talking to our friends and family and stuff, but we weren't really using it for business. And there were some people, a lot of the music industry really used it as a business tool, but for the clothing brands and stuff like that, it took us a little while to kind of get um, kind of involved. And I'm speaking for myself. Maybe there are clothing brand owners that knew when MySpace first jumped off, they knew how to use it and they were promoting. But from what I remember, I don't remember too many advertisements on MySpace. A lot of it was just, you know, people promoting music and then people kind of just, yeah, showing pictures of themselves. And like I say, catching up with people. It was really just a social platform for people to, to gather and talk to each other, I guess. Now, you know, social media is such a big part of everybody, everybody's lives where, you know, advertisements and stuff like that, you have to get a little bit more clever on how you do it. But back then it, it was kind of hard because magazines were still a thing. Uh, radio spots were still a thing. Um, there was different ways of advertising outside of guerrilla marketing with posters and stickers and stuff. But there were always different ways of getting your clothes 
um, kind of seen by the people that you wanted to buy your stuff. So getting your clothes on like a famous rapper or getting your clothes on an athlete or getting your stuff kind of just into that celebrity spotlight was a big deal. I remember trying that so much because one of my big homies, Eric Hirakani, who used to run uh, 110 South Street where rest in peace to Eric, but shout out to him because he was very, very instrumental on showing his clothes in that sort of light because he would either get 110 South on LA rappers, West Coast rappers. Um, if he didn't get it on them, he would get a picture with them holding the shirt up. And he was good at doing this for the Source Magazine, rap pages, any like I think this is even before double XL and stuff like that. He was always in these spaces where either the rappers wearing the clothes or holding up the clothes or shouting them out or whatever it is. He would just knew how to get into these spaces. So when I seen that, I was like, man, I need to try to do that too. And he was good enough to where even if the rapper wasn't holding it up, he'd get a picture of him wearing 110 South and taking a picture with that celebrity. And then that actual picture would get ran in the source magazine or maybe it was at an award show and for some weird reason he was on the red carpet and he was in the mix with all these rappers and he's getting his clothes seen by a ton of people and like i said he really embraced the west coast like if you know anything about los angeles the 110 freeway is basically the heartbeat to los angeles and that's why he named it 110 south but he knew how to get his stuff into the faces of the people that are going to buy it and his marketing and his promotion that brand started in 98 and it's still in production till this day you know luckily the homies that that were all part of it from the beginning have kept that legacy alive even after eric passed away but i always remembered seeing 110 south somewhere like i said in the source magazine or any of these rap magazines um before social media this was just you know seeing it out was like, oh, damn, that's crazy. And then seeing, you know, rappers like DJ Quick and High C and these guys really embracing the brand. You got Dub C and Ice Cube wearing it. And I was like, oh, man. And this is just a dude from the South Bay that just had a dream and was just like, hey, I'm going to get this thing rolling. You know what I mean? And he was basically the blueprint for myself on how I needed to get my gear into the faces of the people that are going to be potentially buying my stuff. Right. So I kind of followed his footsteps. I just didn't know how to do it. Like I knew what he was doing. I just didn't, I thought anybody can go out and do these types of things, but it was also building up a network, building up connections and getting your, you know, yourself into the right places. I didn't understand that part. I just understood I need to be where the celebrities or the athletes or the rappers are so I could get my stuff on them. But I didn't understand how he was doing it. And that was the part that I really lacked. So when I started making clothes and when I started trying to get my stuff onto rappers and, and celebrities and athletes and all these different, you know, influential figures, I was striking out left and right because I didn't know that he had these connections. I didn't know that he already built up his network to be in these special places. So for myself, what I was doing was like, let's say somebody signing autographs at a tower record somewhere. I would go with my clothes and I would try to, you know, get my clothes to that person and me being a nobody going up, waiting in line to, you know, buy this person's album so I could get the autograph. And then that way I have that FaceTime with the rapper and I could be like, hey, man, here's this shirt. Or, you know, can I get a picture with you or whatever it is? It didn't go as well as I thought it would because he made it look easy. Like Eric made it look super easy. But for myself, I was striking out where it was like dudes were like grabbing the T-shirt, throwing it on the table. Like, yeah, thanks. Here, sign this, blah, blah, blah. And they're out of here. And I remember thinking like, man, how come I'm not getting these pictures or how come I'm not, you know, I'm not successful in this style of marketing or how come these rappers ain't messing with my clothes? One of them being, and I remember this very, very vividly was I was kind of waiting. I was at a, outside of a Tower Records and everybody that was in line, I wasn't even into the Tower Records yet. Well, I was still standing on the outside. And there was another dude that was with me that he was trying to get his demo to the actual rapper. And I, I don't want to say the rapper's name, but I remember standing there and kind of just like waiting. And he's like, yeah, you know, when I get there, it's going to cost me 15 bucks to buy this album. But at least I'm going to get a chance to hand my demo 
to him and then potentially open some doors. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm here to do. I'm like, I'm trying to do this. And this is the T-shirt I made. I'm trying to get a picture with him and hopefully he'll rock it and whatever. And, you know, my dreams were way bigger than my reality at that time. And so I'm standing there and we're waiting. And then finally the dude's like, well, let me see the shirt. And I show him the shirt and he was like, what the hell does that mean? And the brand name that I had at the time didn't mean nothing. It meant something to me, but it didn't mean nothing to nobody. The The graphic was very standard. It was like some regular ass text. And he looked at it and he was just like, well, what does that mean? Or why are you giving it to him? And I'm like, I just need to get these pictures with him holding it up. So then that way I could show people like, hey, this rapper endorses my clothing. And the dream crushing conversation that I had with that person was just like, well, why him? Like, why this rapper? Like, what does your clothing brand and that rapper have to do with anything? Or why would he wear that? And I'm like, because it's dope. And he was like, well, it just says this. Like, what What about that makes that rap? Like, what's going to make him be like, oh, yeah, you know what? I want to wear that. What I didn't understand is 110 South was such a powerful name. And everybody knew what 110 South was. It didn't need any explanation. If you're from Los Angeles, you know what the 110 is. Obviously, it speaks for itself. I didn't understand that part at that time. All I understood was I have a T-shirt that's screen printed that I need to get to this person so I could get the picture. Every single time that I've done this, right, whether it's, you know, somebody signing autographs or I find out, you know, a celebrity is somewhere and I rush down over there to try to get my T-shirt into their hands. The drive was there, like the idea was dope. And, you know, I was very ambitious in the sense of I need to get this to this person. But the strikeouts were it, it was crushing, man. Anytime that, you know, like I said, somebody would just grab the shirt, throw it on the table, like, yeah, thanks. Or they'd be like, nah, 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 I don't want that. Or if I try to get a picture and I'm holding up the shirt, you know, they put the the shirt down, like, nah, don't do that. And I'm like, come on, man. And for me, that was uh, an eye opener, to say the least, of I can't do what he does, what Eric was doing. It didn't work for me. And I just didn't understand that at the time. But I thought that's the only way to market your clothes because that's what I was exposed to. That's what I seen somebody else doing. So I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to do the same exact thing he's doing. Didn't work out that way for me. So after, you know, many, many failed attempts, many failed attempts, there were so many things that I needed to kind of re-engineer for myself. Um, the logo, the design, the brand name, stuff like that. I needed to make something relatable. Um, I need to figure out different ways of getting into the faces of the people because all of these strikeouts, the only people I'm talking to is the people online and it's costing me money because I have to buy these albums or I have to buy the poster that they're going to sign or whatever it is. I just wasn't thinking like 100% what it was going to get me to do this, right? I just thought I needed a picture with the celebrity, you know, that's going to help my brand. But like I said, there's no social media back then. So there's no way of actually showing that picture off besides in person to somebody. And in my head, I was like, you know what? I'll run, you know, I'll get a small half page ad in a magazine and that picture is going to be on there. Then people are going to say, hey, look, this athlete and this rapper are endorsing this brand. That's how I thought it used to work, but obviously it doesn't work that way. And the more I thought about it, the more crushing it was to me where I wanted to stop or I wanted to kind of give up because like, I'm like, man, this ain't working out. And the more I thought about that, the more it made me think, why? Why isn't this working? Why doesn't this strategy work for myself? If it worked for Eric, how come it doesn't work for me? And then on top of that, I used to think, well, what was he doing different that I'm not doing. And it made me really, really want to research what he was doing. At that time, he passed away and I wasn't able to do that. I wasn't able to ask him questions. I, I didn't have access to, to you know, his brain where I could just be like and pick his brain as much as possible. And I kind of fault myself because my cousins and, and my uncles, they were friends with him. That's how I knew him. Um, I wasn't a friend like I was younger than him and he didn't know who I was, but I knew of him because of my family members. And I wish I would have took more advantage of, you know, 
asking him or even just expressing that I was into the same thing. Like I wanted to start my own brand, but I didn't have that opportunity to do it. So it was kind of just figuring things out on my own. Um, but it was dope to see. And I think that's what was the big one for myself was I understood how to print. I spent all these years learning how to screen print. I understood where to buy blank t-shirts from. Um, my graphic design skills were not good, um, but they were, it was enough to burn screens, I guess you could say. But it wasn't to where it was appealing. It, it didn't look cool. I just didn't understand that part of the game yet. All I knew was the production side, how to make the shirts, where to get the shirts, where to get the ink, how to burn screens. I knew that, but I didn't know anything about selling the stuff or marketing or anything. Now, after doing all that research and doing a little bit of soul searching and saying, hey, you know what? This ain't working out for me. I need to figure this part out was me thinking, all right, who do I want to sell stuff to? When I say that, I'm talking about like, who's my target audience? At the time, I didn't know it was called the target audience. I was just thinking, where can I find customers? Like, how am I going to sell this stuff? How am I going to get people to like it? So what I started doing was instead of going to the, like the big famous rappers and the big, uh, you know, celebrities and athletes and stuff like that. I just started hitting up the local dudes, the dudes that were in the circuit. Like I was part of this small music scene uh, in Los Angeles or in the South Bay, really. Um, I kind of knew who was who and I kind of knew, um, you know, who was quote unquote touring, just doing like a California tour or doing shows, who was putting out new music. I was privy to all that. So I said, instead of going to these well-established guys, these guys are on the come up. Why don't I just go to them and be like, hey, check it out. These are some shirts that I made. Maybe I can make your tour shirts or I can make shirts that say your name and then it'll have my logo on it and just started working with local talent that way because now I'm getting more exposure and the doors aren't getting slammed in my face because these guys are hungry to make a name for themselves. Here's somebody that makes t-shirts. I'm coming in, kind of knocking stuff out. That was my, I guess, in uh, when it came to figuring out how to get my stuff seen by uh, a lot of people, right? And whether those shows are only 20, 30 people at the shows, whether these guys don't have a big following, but they're out promoting every single day, it's kind of me just riding on the backs of them and being like, all right, you know, if you're going to be out there doing this, you should have a shirt that says your name. And on the back of the shirt, it's going to have my brand on it. And we're going to be going, you know, everywhere together. And that's what ended up working out better for me. Not in the sense of I'm starting to sell more t-shirts, but just getting my name out. And what that ended up doing was that started to get my name out as the guy that made shirts. It wasn't because people were coming to me to buy my clothing brand. It was there wasn't a lot of people out there screen printing in this space. So that's what got my name out to actually start printing for other local rappers, rap groups, um, anybody that was trying to promote stuff. That's how I got into a lot of the car club stuff was being the guy that was printing, you know, the rapper's name or their new album on a T-shirt. And on the back had my branding and it had my you know business on it. So that's what opened the doors for myself. I understood this part because when I was in, you know, making music and around people that were making music, there was so many people that wanted to be a rapper at the time and so many people that wanted to be producers, but there wasn't nobody, you know, making posters. There wasn't nobody printing CD sleeves. There wasn't nobody duplicating CDs. So then that's when I said, hey, you know what? Let me invest in this CD burning tower. Let me start printing people's jewel cases sleeves or let me start, you know, printing up the inserts, designing the inserts. This is how I started to get my graphic design skills up and my chops up with Photoshop because I needed to learn how to actually do the graphics for album covers and put the track listing on and do all that stuff. But I knew there wasn't a lot of people doing it. So instead of being in front of the camera, in front of the microphone or, or being the guy, the rapper or producer or whatever, I seen more money in being the dude behind the scenes. And now I'm printing t-shirts for people. I'm printing CD jewel sleeves, um, the inserts. I'm doing CD duplication. Um, I started even doing, you know, printing on the CDs. And it made my value and worth in the same industry a lot greater and a lot bigger than trying to be, you know, 
a up and coming rapper or up and coming producer or singer songwriter or whatever it is. I seen the benefit in the production side of things. What I didn't know at the time was this was myself. I was giving myself practice when it came down to graphic design. I was giving myself practice uh, when it came to talking to clients and uh, figuring out, you know, what my worth is for my pricing, um, how long it took me to, to design stuff because there wasn't a lot of graphic designers designing album covers and mixtape covers and stuff like that or demos. So I was known as the guy that could do T-shirts for you. I could do, you know, your CD or mixtape. Um, start to finish. I could do the whole insert, the sleeve, the jewel case, uh, CD, duplication, everything. And I started selling it as a package deal. So, you know, what I first initially set out to do was be the guy that people are buying their clothing brand or buying my clothing brand, right? I wanted people to buy my t-shirts. I wanted people to buy, um, you know, my branded merch. What ended up happening was I started to sell my services more than anything. So now it became the guy that was the one, you know, printing up t-shirts. There wasn't a lot of guys out there doing it, especially from home. So I was the one printing up their t-shirts for different groups and crews and record labels and, and all that stuff. And then it was, well, let me do the CDs for you. I can do, you got an album coming out or you're doing an EP. I can do the sleeves for you. I can do the inserts for you. I could duplicate all the CDs for you. And it was investing in myself, meaning I seen the worth in having, you know, a tower that burnt 10 CDs. I seen um, the worth in going out and buying jewel cases in bulk instead of going to Best Buy and buying, you know, a 50 pack. Now I was going to downtown LA and I was buying, you know, spindles of 100 pack CDs for like four bucks. And then I was buying jewel cases at, I want to say like a quarter of a jewel case or something like that, but I was buying them by the case. And turning around and, and, you know, charging people, you know, the whole service, it'd be like $6 complete for CD, jewel case, and the insert. Or if I wasn't using jewel cases and I was just doing um, the CD sleeves um, printed front and back with track listing on them and um, shrink wrapped, I was charging people, you know, five bucks for those. And it only cost me maybe $1.20 a piece um, to make. And I was killing, like I was making so much money doing this, but it was showing me how to actually run a legitimate print business, right? I was kind of like a print broker at that time. There's some stuff I did in-house, some stuff that I outsourced, but it just gave me the opportunity to get FaceTime with people, learn how to sell my services. And then on top of that, understanding what my services were. I needed to take a step back from being the guy that wanted to run a clothing brand to being the guy that's just printing t-shirts for other people. And then it eventually turned into me printing for other clothing brands. And that to me was more, I guess, beneficial in the business sense because I, I wasn't, I had to, take a step back from what I like originally really wanted to do what which was you know run a clothing brand and understand where the money's coming in from and then where to focus my energy at so that's when I was like you know what at the time I wasn't thinking like all right this is just going to be training for me at the time I'm just winging it and trying to figure this stuff out and I'm figuring out what works for me and what doesn't work for me and I remember um the first thing I used to do was uh shrink wrap the the actual jewel cases and use the heat gun to kind of seal everything up. After a while, I was like, this, it was a nice touch for the actual CD, but it wasn't needed, especially for jewel cases, right? So then I stopped offering that. Like that was something I invested in where I'm, you know, have all this shrink wrap and the heat guns and stuff. And I was like, man, this is an added step, which is cool, but it's not needed. These guys don't care about that stuff. So then I stopped doing that. Then I figured out, all right, here's a company that could print the CD envelopes, like the the sleeves and they offer shrink wrapping there so I could just have them do everything delivered to me so I'll outsource that part and then you know middleman it for these guys and they don't have to know that I'm not doing it in-house they just need to know that they're getting their CDs delivered to them and then once I started packaging everything up with all right I'm going to do this many t-shirts for you I'm going to do this many uh CDs and albums for you that's when I started focusing on my price and how long does stuff take for me to get it going? And then how can I actually, you know, make a ton of money off of this? And I ran that thing for a while, all the while 
focusing on the clothing brand because now I'm figuring out, all right, who's my target audience? Who do I want to sell to? I see what everybody's doing. I see what everybody's putting out, but how can I put my foot into this space and then actually, you know, flourish in this space? And from then on, that's when everything not really changed for me, but it, it just opened my eyes to different parts of the business. Even though I set out to do one thing, I had the tools to do other things and make money in that space. I just needed to understand where to focus my energy. And this is what kind of uh, got me interested in marketing and understanding, you know, your clientele and your target audience and stuff like that was failing at first, trying to mimic what um, the homie Eric was doing. And then doing something totally different um, that had nothing to do with what I set out to do. And it always made me go back and re-engineer what I was doing, what I was working towards. That's when I, I started to really look at, all right, what do the people want? How do I give the people what they want? Because I figured it out with rappers. They wanted jewel cases. They wanted mixtape covers. They wanted graphic design. They wanted logos made. They wanted t-shirts with their names on it. And I understood that. And when that kind of uh, hit for me was the light bulb went off was these guys, there's a need for a lot of this stuff. And in the industry, there isn't a lot of people doing it. There's so many people that want to be the rappers, but there's not a lot of people that want to do the production side of things. Not producing, but like meaning the legwork for logo design and, you know, album cover design and mixtape design, and then figuring out who's going to burn the CDs for you when the album's done and all that. If I just brought it to them with a full package service, it makes it easier for them. And I knew who my clientele was. I knew like there was, you know, rock bands that I used to do, metal bands that I used to do. There's so many people that I used to offer this service to that it just made sense for me to understand my clientele better, understand my potential customers better and give them what they want. And then that's what trickled down into doing the clothing brand. And then at that time I was like, all right, let me start these clothing brands. And then all of these rappers and bands and artists that I was already printing for and designing for, I'd be like, Hey, check it out, man. I'm starting this new brand. And I started to use them. And then I'd give them a t-shirt or a hoodie or something that I made. And then I'm helping them out. So now they're helping me out. Now they're wearing my stuff on stage without me even asking. It's like, all right, this dude's been printing my mixtape covers or he was instrumental in, in printing all my merch. I'll rock his stuff because we had built up that network. And that's the part that I didn't understand that Eric had. Eric built up his network over the years with all of these rappers and celebrities to be in these spaces. I was just not aware of that until I started to build up my own network. And a lot of the guys that, you know, I used to work with, especially like just to touch on, on the music stuff a little bit, I understood that there wasn't a lot of people that had home studios at the time. And this is like way before Pro Tools came out or Pro Tools was out, but Pro Tools was only accessible f or it only worked on Mac computers. And this is back when the DigiDesign 001 and 002 interface was um, first came out. And this is way before Mboxes and all that stuff. And um, I knew there was a benefit to having a home studio. Outside of, you know, writing music and recording music and stuff, I understood that there was a lot of guys that didn't know where to record at. So I started to charge people to record at my house. Like in my parents' garage, I set up, I had moving blankets everywhere to dampen the noise. I made a makeshift booth. Um, I had, I, I was recording on a software that was free. It was, it was a rip software called Cool Edit Pro. Cool Edit Pro um, eventually became Adobe Audition years later. But Cool Edit Pro wa was this uh, uh, kind of a bare bones recording software that you can use and you needed an interface with it. And I think I had an M-Audio preamp for the mic. I had a condenser mic. I had decent enough equipment to record people and somewhat master it. I didn't know anything about mastering, but I knew how to balance people's vocals and I knew how I just learned how to do it. Um, then I'll charge people to come to my, you know, my parents' house to their garage and I charged them. I wasn't even charging by the hour, man. I was charging per song that people did. And I started making, you know, I started recording full mixtapes for people and full albums for people in that garage. And it sounded good in the car. And, you know, it wasn't, professionally mastered it was just mastered by my dumbass 
And that's how I started to create these relationships um, and just understanding what the need was and then me filling that void and filling the need for these guys. So there's a bunch of rappers that need somewhere to record. Why not make somewhere for them to record? And once I figured everything out and learned the software because I was recording myself and writing music for myself, I knew how to do this. Then I just started offering it to the people. So I... That's how I kind of, my brain uh, used to work or still works to this day is figuring out, all right, who's not doing something? How can I, you know, bring some sort of value to this space? And then how can I be the one that uh, people pay for this service? Because there's not a lot of people doing it, right? There's a ton of people writing music. There's a ton of people um, um, rapping. There's a ton of people that are producing. What can I do that's part of this industry where I can make money. And that's what it was, was one, being a ghostwriter was, was a cool thing for myself. I used to write it for a lot of people. Um, but outside of that, it was being the person that could record people. I don't call myself an engineer. I didn't go to school for it, but that's basically what it was. People came to my house, I recorded them, um, balanced all their stuff, and then they went home with a CD of their new song or songs or whatever they did. And that's how I met a lot of cool people, man. And knowing these people and then offering all these other services to people, T-shirts and, you know, CD sleeves, graphic design, all that. I seen a bigger worth in going that route than trying to be the most famous ghostwriter or the most famous rapper or the most famous singer out there. That's just what it was for me. And like I said, I built really dope relationships, man. Um, and fast forward through all of that. I've always wanted to create clothing brands. I've always printed. I've always did that stuff. So I just understood how to sell my services now. I understood who my target audience would be. And then I understood I need to make stuff that the people want, right? Being somebody that can record your vocals and has a makeshift you know, studio or vocal booth in their garage made me valuable because I had what people wanted. I had a service that not everybody was offering at the time. Now home studios are everywhere. You can record in a, in a hotel room. But back then, not a lot of people were doing it. So I knew that there was a need for it. And I was delivering a service that people wanted. Graphic design, same exact thing. I was putting like regular ass text with like crazy amounts of shadow and glow on them. Um, these are like old school mixtapes and old school album covers where you know, I knew the person wanted their face on there. So I take a picture with a, you know, small little point and shoot camera, um, throw it into Photoshop, put a glow around them. I put, you know, mansions and Lamborghinis in the background of them. Um, and then all the text had a crazy glow and, you know, people loved it at the time. And that was just, you know, then people started hitting me up for logos. Hey, can you make a logo? I'm gonna start this record label. Can you make a logo for this? And can you make a logo for my artists or make a logo for my name or whatever? And then it was just me finding fonts. And that's how I ended up eventually finding different font sites and, and manipulating fonts and stuff. So all of this comes down to knowing how to market yourself and knowing where to focus your energy on. You know what I mean? I set out to do one thing and it didn't work. And then eventually it rolled into something that I had no idea I was even going to get into. And it was understanding my target audience, understanding what I was selling, whether it's a product or a service, I'm selling it to somebody because I understand that that somebody, there's a need for it. They relate to me. I have something that they want. I have something that they need. And then that's how we get it going. Right. Um, now, once I started the clothing brands and stuff and using the people that I knew and utilizing my network and my connections, it was how am I going to get, all right, I got this t-shirt onto this rapper or I got this t-shirt, you know, into this magazine or I, I was successful in getting this t-shirt onto this person, but how am I going to generate the sales? How am I going to make people know that I'm the one that sells that t-shirt? I got so caught up in wanting to be the man, like be the face of the brand that I was losing sight on the real, like kind of the real uh, objective of what we're doing is to make money. But I was so caught up in, I wanted people to know that I'm the one selling it. This is, you don't go to that rapper to buy the shirt. You come to me to buy the shirt. And my ego was getting the best of me where I was losing sight at, of making money. And that should always be 
goal number one in your head is how am I going to make money? How am I going to be profitable? But I was so caught up in wanting people because now I'm getting, you know, I'm getting visibility. I'm getting people to see my clothes. I'm getting people that are interested in my shirts, but they don't know that I'm the one behind the brand. They don't know the one I'm printing and designing it. And I'm the one, the, the mastermind behind all this. All they see is, you know, their favorite local rapper wearing the shirt and they're like, hey, I want to get that shirt. How can I get it? And I was so busy in trying to be in front of these things or have a merch booth at, at all these shows to be able to do this because I wanted my face associated with what it is that I started to lose um, traction in everything that I was building towards because, like I said, my ego got the best of me. And there's so many people out there that I know struggle with this because they want their face um to be seen. They want people to know that they own this brand. They want people to know that they're the business owner and what they're doing and all this stuff. Once I started to get a like reality set in for me and I understood that that's not what I'm doing all this for is when I started to see actual profit. But before I seen profit, it was mainly I was seeing a bunch of losses because I wanted to be the man. I wanted to be the, I wanted everybody to know that it was me making the clothes. I wanted everybody to see my face and be like, man, that's the guy that does these t-shirts or whatever. And uh, like I said, that was a, a big downfall for me. That was something that I, I didn't realize, I was blinded at first. And then once money wasn't coming in, then I knew. I was like, oh shit, yeah, it's cool to be the guy and be the man and all that, but what makes more sense? I'm starting these clothing brands because I wanna make money. You know what I mean? And I got so caught up in being known as the guy that prints amongst my peers and amongst the rappers that were using my services, but I felt like I wanted more people to know who I was instead of I wanted more people to know the brand. And then that's when light bulb goes off again and it's like yo i need to figure out my customer base i need to figure out how to get my clothes in the faces of the customers that are potentially going to buy from me and then i need to i need them to not care who runs the brand that was the other part of my my journey coming up was i had to be able to take a step back and be like you know my dumbass face isn't selling the clothes it's the designs on the t-shirt that matter most. And once I started to really figure that part out and hone in on that, that's when I started to make more creative designs. I started to be able to detach myself from the actual brand of wanting to be the man to actually promoting the clothes, advertising the clothes, advertising and marketing turned into a game for me where it was, all right, these guys are my target audience. Where the hell Am I going to find them? Do I need to go here? Do I need to be where they're at? And I always used to think, all right, I need to be on Melrose. I need to be on Fairfax. I need to be showing this stuff off because that's my target audience. What I didn't understand was those people were already kind of like into their own thing. They were shopping on Melrose and Fairfax because they were shopping for their favorite brands already. I need to, I needed to really understand where my core target audience is, not me getting new, um, customers it was where the hell are my customers at now that's when I started to figure out all right anytime I show up here or anytime I'm selling clothes here or anytime I'm wearing my stuff this group of people appreciates what I wear or what I'm wearing what I'm selling and stuff like that then I just started to play into those small pockets of groups instead of being the man on Melrose now I'm the man on Crenshaw or I'm the man on Vermont or I'm the man on Fig like I'm going to these smaller areas where it's populated and the people are at. And I just started following around the popular rappers that were wearing my clothes because I was printing for them and they were wearing my stuff. That's how I started to like build up more people being interested in the brand. Um, and like I said, this is all, you know, early stages of social media. So social media wasn't a big deal at the time. And then it was just me being out with the people. And then that's when flyers were a big thing. If you partied, you know, uh, in Los Angeles, I'm pretty sure you partied anywhere. 90s to the early 2000s, flyers were like a big thing where 
I started to, because I had the connection with the print shop already because I'm printing CD sleeves and all that. So now anytime that I'm vending out somewhere, I'm bringing my clothes to sell, I'm making sure people are leaving with a flyer that has, you know, my information, the shirts that I'm selling, all that stuff, the mission statement to, you know, the brand. Um, that's where I started utilizing a lot of the pictures of the local artists that I was with. So if I'm going somewhere and somebody has a show, let's say down here in the South Bay at the Brixton or St. Rock or something like that. And I'm there, obviously I'm handing stuff out and I seen the power in making sure somebody left with something uh, that had my branding, that had my clothes on it, that had, you know, some sort of information for them. And that's when I started to really, really utilize the aspect of takeaways. You know, when you go to like conventions or you go places and these big companies are giving you, you know, lanyards and, and pens and, you know, all kind of weird little takeaways, wristbands and all that stuff. That's you leaving with something that's branded from that company. And then once I started to incorporate that into what I was doing, it just made more sense. Fast forward to social media becoming an actual thing. Um, I've always viewed social media as a tool to sell anything on. And, you know, one of the crazy things was, um, this is like years ago before OfferUp came up when Craigslist was just um, happening. There was people that were, you know, you could sell anything on Craigslist and they started cracking down on certain things that people were doing. And I thought it was pretty funny. Um, because I I understood what people were doing and this is kind of sidetracking from, from the story, but it has something to do with marketing is um, people on Craigslist were getting in trouble for like selling like, let's say uh, bullets, like ammo, right? Um, you weren't allowed to sell ammo to people on, a, on a Craigslist. So then what people were doing was they would have like, let's say like an aquarium, like a fish tank, and then they'd have all the ammo inside the fish tank. And then they would say, buy this aquarium right here for, you know, $900. And it comes with all the contents inside. So they're not promoting that they're selling ammo on the subject header. It doesn't say like, you know, 45 cal, whatever. It was the listing was an aquarium, right? And then inside the aquarium had boxes of ammo. So people were... You would go to like to, to the local like gun shop, right? And then they would say, um, if you wanted to buy stuff or, you know, look up aquarium or look up whatever it is, or you would go to the gun show, right? Um, over here in, in uh, Los Angeles or Southern California, there would be one in Costa Mesa and they'd be like, uh, you'd walk around and be like, hey man, if you want to buy more stuff from me, just look me up on Craigslist under aquariums. And be like, well, what the hell do you mean? I'm like, yeah, well, we're not allowed to sell ammo on there but when you go on there and look up aquariums there's a ton of fish tanks on there that have bullets inside of the aquarium so when we're talking marketing and being clever and stuff like that it just made me think about that was there are so many people that found the loophole or not even the loophole but just found a way around something and to me that always stuck out in my head was uh yeah you know there's certain things that are in your face and there's certain things that are, are promoted to you that are, you know, right out in the open. But then there's ways like that, like the aquarium thing where it's, if you knew, you knew. And if you were at the gun show and you, you know, talked to this gentleman that was selling ammo and he was like, yeah, you know, we could, you know, I sell ammo on Craigslist and then they say how they're doing it. And it's like, all right, yeah, all you got to do is look up, you know, 80 gallon aquariums or whatever, you'll see all my posts come up on Craigslist and then that's the stock that I have. That kind of stuff to me is very interesting because it plays into, you know, tricking somebody. So there's somebody on the backside of Craigslist that's getting duped. And then it's playing into that person that's selling the stuff, their creativity on how to do stuff. I like that kind of stuff because it makes me think outside the box also not that i'm selling bullets on craigslist or anything like that but that's just that was like i said things like that intrigue me because it forces me to think outside the box also so when we're talking about social media and how i do stuff now um my strategy on how i sell anything that i make on social media has not changed 
um, because I've seen the most profit in this strategy and it's free. It takes a little bit of work, but I've have a ton of videos about this same exact strategy, but the way it works is I'm basically tricking people into looking at my clothes without them even knowing that they're going to look at my clothes. Um, so what I do is I'll get on to Instagram and this works till this day. I'll get on to Instagram and let's say I'm selling t-shirts for, I don't know, people that drive or let's not even say that. Like, let's say it's like people that own French bulldogs, right? I have a brand that's geared towards dog owners or dog lovers or, you know, dogs in general. So I get on and I look up, you know, French bulldog hashtag or something like that. And then there's tons of pictures of French bulldogs. People that own French bulldogs are going to post their picture of their dogs, right? And they're going to hashtag French bulldog and the dog's name and blah, blah, blah. And there's just a general interest there of French bulldogs. Now, I have a brand that's geared towards dog lovers. Maybe it's not just the French Bulldogs. Maybe it's dog lovers in general. So this will work for like a ton of different dog species or, or breeds or whatever. But we'll use French Bulldogs here. So now on my person or on my brand's page, I'm going to have the pictures of the t-shirts that I sell, right? You're going to see product photos or maybe my dumbass wearing a shirt that says, you know, I love Frenchies or... Um, something about dog lovers or something along the lines of whatever I'm selling. Now, I'm going to go on that person's page that posts their French Bulldog. And maybe I won't even comment on that page, but I have access to their page now, right? I found them through the French Bulldog um, hashtag. They posted a picture of their French Bulldog. So I know their page isn't private because I seen it. So I click on their name and now there's posts of everything outside of dogs, right? It could be, you know, them at the concert. Maybe they went to a, a Raider game and I could comment on any of those pictures. And all I'm doing is picking a random picture. Like if they went to the Raider game, I'm like, hey, I've never been to that stadium before. How was it? How was the experience? How were your seats? What was your seat number? I could ask any question. doesn't matter what it is. It has nothing to do with French Bulldogs. I know they own a French Bulldog because that's how I found the page. But my comment to them doesn't have to be about the dog. So I comment about the Raider game and they're going to see the comment. They're going to see a name that they don't recognize and be like, what the hell? Who the hell is this guy? They'll comment back maybe or maybe their first thing and you do this. I do this. Everybody does this. Somebody comments on your page. The first thing you do is click on them to see if they know you. Do I know this person that's commenting about the Raider game? What they're going to do is click on that name. They're going to come to my page. The first six to nine pictures that they see on my page to see if they know me is going to be French Bulldog t-shirts or dog t-shirts in general, right? So now I have somebody that is a general or a genuine potential customer. There's an interest there. I make shirts for dog owners. They own a French Bulldog. So my t-shirts would speak to them. I got this person to look at my clothes for free based off of one question. Now, you're probably thinking like, man, that's stupid. I'm not going to hit up a million people. You know how many people you could hit up by searching a hashtag and commenting on those pages just in a small 10 minute window? There are so many people that you can go through and you do it now while you're watching this. Go to Instagram, search a hashtag or search any subject. They're going to pull up anybody that's posted anything about that general interest. All you have to do is scroll down, look for somebody, and you could kind of tell what pages are like meme pages or like spam accounts versus somebody that's actually, you know, posting. And all you have to do is click on that. Now you know this is a potential customer. They have a general interest in whatever you're selling. If it's lowriders, use a lowrider hashtag. Go in there, click on it. They probably own a lowrider. Maybe they're fixing up a lowrider. They have a project car. Maybe they're part of a lowrider club. Maybe they just love lowriders. And you have t-shirts that are being sold and made for lowrider owners and lowrider enthusiasts. You click on there, on their page. You, I don't know, they had spaghetti for dinner. Like, hey, man, what kind of spaghetti sauce you use? Or is it homemade? Or whatever it is. It could be anything. That person's going to say, hey, who the hell just commented on my spaghetti post. Do I know this person? Click on the page. 
It's going to bring them to your business's page and boom, now they see all these lowrider t-shirts. How else would you get people to see your clothing for free and you are genuinely handpicking potential customers? The reason you're handpicking these people is because you know that they have an interest and they can relate to what you're selling. This is my strategy that's worked forever. I still use it to this day. Nothing's changed because there are people that use social media for the social aspect. Not everybody on social media is selling stuff. Your customers, your clientele, people are using social media. They live on social media. We all have it in our pockets. We all use it for different reasons. This is my way of getting people to look at my clothes. Now, just because they look, does that mean they're going to buy? No, but it's a numbers game at that point. Like I said, 10 minutes, let's say you're taking a dump. You're on the toilet. You're already looking at social media while you're sitting on the toilet. Why not hit up a handful of people? Like I said, sit down, go on a popular hashtag that has something to do with your brand. Start looking for people and engage with conversation. Just start the conversation. Ask the question, go to the next page, find somebody else, ask another question, go to the next page, keep going down. You'd be amazed how many people you could hit up in just 10 minutes. And do you have to sit there and go back and forth with everybody? No. All you're trying to do is get people to look at your page. People say, well, I'll just like their page or I'll, I'll just comment with an emoji. That's fine. But to me, I've seen the most success when I engage with them, when I actually open a conversation because people are people. We're human beings. If somebody asks a question that's not far-fetched, obviously, a lot of times we'll answer the question. And curiosity will always get the best of people. And curiosity is what's going to make people click on your name to see who the hell you are. And the first four or three, six or nine things they're going to see on that page is products that relate to them. There is an interest between that person and what you're selling. And they're going to look and be like, oh, shit, that's tight. Damn, this is a cool ass shirt. How else would that one person find your T-shirts to see? If they're not searching for it, they're never going to find it. But now you hand selected one person to look at your stuff. Now, imagine if you hit up a few hundred people a day and you might say, damn, that's a lot of people. It's not a lot of people. It's very easy to do before you go to work hit up a few people. On your lunch break, hit up a few people. When you get home from work, hit up a few people. Easy call. Then you put your phone down. You don't even have to deal with it. But people are starting to look at your page now and be aware of what the hell you're doing because you didn't sell them nothing. You didn't sell them one thing. All you did was ask a question about anything on their profile. Anything. Doesn't matter what it is. Think about that. If somebody went to your page, right? your personal Instagram, not your business's page, but your personal Instagram. And let's say you posted a picture of, I don't know, your kid, or you posted a picture of a family outing or, you know, your Christmas photos or something like that. And let's say some rando goes on there and be like, hey man, that's a cool Christmas tree or that's something, whatever is in the post. And you look, the first thing you're going to do is like, who the hell is this person? Do I know them? You're going to click on the name. And when you click on the name to see who the hell it is, you're going to see three to six posts on there. And if they did their research on you and seen that you went to a Steeler game or you went to a Laker game and they're selling Laker themed stuff, they know that you have an interest in the Lakers. They know that one of their t-shirts might appeal to you. And that's how this shit works for me. I've shown this for the last, I don't know how many years on it on YouTube. I have a ton of videos on this just to bring, just to bring brand awareness to your brand. This is the easiest way to do it. This is how I generate majority of my sales. You guys know I don't sell shit on YouTube. YouTube is my biggest following and I never promote my t-shirts on YouTube because you guys aren't my target audience. I go to my target audience on social media and I engage with them. That's how I make my sales. That's how I get people interested in my clothes. That's how I make people aware of my clothes that I make is going to their page and handpicking them without them even knowing that I'm handpicking them. It's the easiest form of marketing. It takes a little bit of work, but it is a, is it a get rich quick scheme? No, this is all you're doing is engaging with your customers. Imagine if you were selling something out in public, but 
like let's use the dogs for example if you were selling dog related shirts obviously you would go to like a dog show right or you would go to some sort of event that's made for dogs if you took your like social media is everybody in the world and let's say you're in the mall and you have a dog clothing uh, store or boutique in the middle of the mall. There's going to be so many people that walk by you that don't even own dogs where it's not even going to appeal to them. But what you're doing is you're bringing in your target audience because you know they own dogs, right? So it's like instead of being in the middle of the mall, now you're going to the dog show where there's a shitload of dog owners. That's all you're doing. And when it's broken down like that, you start to understand it a little bit better. If you own a lowrider brand, does it make sense for you to be at, you know, a, a monster truck rally or a car show that's made for Japanese imported cars and you own a lowrider brand? It doesn't. You need to go to the lowrider show. You need to be where the lowriders are at. All you're doing is you're bringing in lowrider enthusiasts to your brand without them even knowing because you're handpicking them. You know they have a general interest. So when people do like social media marketing um, by the numbers, by the masses, sometimes your ads won't land on certain people's pages. Some, you know, potential customers probably won't see your stuff, even though there's a general interest there, they might not see it because it might get flooded with their other stuff. How many times have you scrolled past ads on social media because you, you don't want to be sold something? So this is my way of not selling stuff, but still selling stuff, if you get what I'm saying. We, the consumer, are so numb to being sold things that we're just like, nah, I don't even care about that shit no more. I don't want to see it. Let me scroll right past it. How many times do you watch a YouTube video? You're probably watching this YouTube video skipping ads because you don't give a shit what they're selling you. That, to me, shows that the consumer is numb to being sold. So how do you sell stuff to somebody that doesn't want to be sold? By not selling them shit. By just engaging with them. The way I'm doing it is I'm coming in the back door and I'm just hitting these people up with general questions and making them aware of my brand without having to sell them, without having to say, hey, come check on my T-shirts. If you commented that on somebody's shit, they're going to be like, man, fuck your T-shirts. I don't want to hear nothing you have to sell because I don't want to be sold nothing. But if you just went to them and just said, hey, man, where'd you buy that pizza from? Chances are they're going to answer you and be like, oh, shit, I bought it from this pizza place down the street from my house or I bought it from this pizza place while I was on vacation. And you just have a general conversation through general conversation curiosity gets the best of everybody they're going to click on your name to see who you are that's when they're going to see your products easy call that's how it works that's my strategy this is my dumb uh ideas that just so happen to work but it all stems from knowing your target audience and how they work and where they live or not where they live but where they are in social media meaning you know what groups are they a part of on facebook what um uh, what events they go to, what are some of their interests and stuff like that. So then that way, you know, you make dog related shirts, they own a dog, but you don't have to comment on their dog picture. You could comment on something else and just start the conversation. Easy, easy call. All right. I can't make enough videos about this strategy. Um, I do it every year. Um, it's in my playlist. If you wanted like a really detailed breakdown um, you can always watch the playlist um, Back to Basics. And Back to Basics is a playlist that's broken down everything that you need to know about running the t-shirt business. Just click on the marketing one and it's full on whiteboard. I'll show you how the shit works if you wanted to watch that. But if you didn't really care, you just want to try this out for yourself, I highly encourage it. It doesn't cost nothing. It's free. Um, it works for myself. That's how I make majority of my t-shirt sales is from this strategy. All it takes is a little bit of hard work. And that hard work is searching up your target audience, their interests, talking to them, opening a conversation, and that's it. You go to the next person and then do the same thing. You go to the next person, do the same thing. All it is is a numbers game at that point. But what you're doing is you're handpicking your potential customers. And those customers have some sort of just interest in what you're selling because you did your research on the customer you know that they are interested in something you're selling because that's what led you to their page is that interest whether it's dogs or lowriders or whatever other kind of whatever you're selling all you have to do is look for the people through hashtags 
And sometimes you don't even have to do hashtags. Sometimes you could just type in an Instagram, you know, whatever it is. You could just type in something. And if somebody's talking about that or posting about that, that interest will pop up. And there's millions of posts on there. And you just go through and just start talking to everybody down the list. That's all it is, all right? Hopefully, this uh, podcast episode right here finds the right people. Um, if you guys enjoy this podcast, I had pretty good... Um, you know, comments on the last one where people enjoyed this kind of stuff and they've been missing uh, bullshit with Brando. So I'm glad that it's back. Um, if you guys have any topics you guys want me to touch on or if there's questions you want me to ask guests or certain guests that you want me to have on, please leave it in the comments for me. Um, I read all the comments, especially with the podcast thing, because I wanted to be fully, fully aware of what the viewers wanted. And it sounds like a lot of people been wanting this stuff, long form podcasts. Um, storytelling, that kind of shit. So I will continue to deliver on this stuff maybe once a month, maybe every two weeks. We'll see how we do it. But um, I do have a lot of interviews banked up and I'm going to start rolling those things out for you guys too, all right? So I appreciate everybody for tuning in, watching this thing. If you have any questions about marketing, advertising, or anything like that, please, please, please put it in the comments. So that way I could either make videos about it or I could, you know, touch on it a little bit for you guys. But I'm here to help. That's all it is, is I want you guys to win. I want you guys to succeed. So that's why I put this type of content out for you guys. All right. Follow me on Instagram if you want to. Big Brando TV. Catch you guys on the next one, man. Yeah.